years ago when President Clinton was with us, he suggested that if we could just educate every girl, a lot of the problems in the developing world would begin to go away. It's my great pleasure to introduce two Pulitzer Prize winning journalists in one family, uh, Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wudun, to discuss their latest book and their incredible work on women and girls. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we're really delighted to be here. And uh, for those of you who saw the program and were expecting only me, indeed, you have twice as much of the sky as you might have expected. Uh, Cheryl was able to fly in as well. We're um, also really just thrilled that, the, uh, the, that Aspen has brought in this woman and girls thread. Um, I think it's a, it, there's some fantastic things going on this whole, this whole week about that. Um, we're going to do this a little bit differently, and we're going to stand up. Now, partly that's because Cheryl and I just came back from the Middle East, and so we're nine hours apart. So this is actually a session where people at risk of falling asleep are not only in the audience, but actually <laughs> up here as well. Um, but we figure this will keep some adrenaline going. Now, it's obviously a little bit unusual for a New York Times columnist to write so much about women and girls around the world. So let me tell you a little bit about how that came to pass. It was when Cheryl and I were correspondents in China, and we began to look at what happened when you did begin to see investments in women and girls around the country. And in particular, for example, there was one time we were out in Hubei province. Anybody here been to Hubei province? I'm actually kind of surprised. OK, Hubei is right in the middle of the country. Um, this is uh, the Dabia Mountains in, in, um, way off in, in the corner of it. This, uh, there was a very rural school. And the brightest kid in that school, a girl called Dai Manju, had to drop out because her parents didn't want to pay $13 in school fees. Essentially, they thought, you know, you might want to pay school fees for a boy, but not for a girl. So we decided to write an article about how so many incredibly bright girls were having to drop out. And we used Daimonju as our example. And her picture was there on the front page of the New York Times. And maybe you can imagine what happened next. Because she had to drop out for $13, we were then deluged with envelopes from readers containing checks with 13, for $13. Um, New York Times readers are incredibly generous in small amounts. Present company accepted. Um, well, in addition to all those checks for $13, we also got a wire transfer for $10,000 to help Dai Manju and the, and the kids in that school. We took all that money down and worked out a deal with the principal, whereby those girls would be able to stay in school as long as they could do the work without paying extra school fees. For the first time in this community, your academic achievement would be a function not of your chromosomes, but of your intellectual capacity. Those girls were thrilled. Uh, well, we decided to call up the donor of that $10,000 to give him a report. We called him up. He seemed a little surprised that we were making this call. And we said how generous he'd been and how much a change, a transformative change he'd, he'd wrought. And he was even more surprised. Well, we said. You just wouldn't believe how far $10,000 will go in rural China. There was a bit of a gasp. And he said, but I didn't send $10,000. I sent $100. <laughs> that was our turn to gasp. <laughs> um, as trained investigative reporters, we sensed a real problem here. It turned out, indeed, that he had only wired $100. But the bank had had a little trouble with that decimal place. We always figure that banker was later put in charge of subprime mortgages, you figure? <laughs> so we didn't know what to do. We couldn't imagine going back to that school and telling all these girls they would have to drop out after all. I'm not really proud of what I did next. I called up the chief spokesman for the bank. You're pretty sharp. <laughs> 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 
we laid it out too, and we explained how they'd made this error. These girls were uh, counting on that extra 9,900 to finish their education. And uh, then we explained about the follow-up article we were writing. <laughs> well, um, we asked now, are you indeed going to try to get that extra 9,900 back and force all these girls to drop out of school on the record? <laughs> the chief spokesman didn't miss a beat. He said, on the record, we're delighted to make a donation of the difference. <laughs> so what you have here, what we had there, was a fascinating natural experiment in what happens when you have this one-time exogenous investment in girls' education in one community in a way that does not happen in all the others around there. And in the subsequent years, that happened in 1990. We've been able to go back and look at what happened in that village compared to all the others. Daimonju herself became the first person in her family to graduate from elementary school, to graduate from middle school, to graduate from high school, and then earned an accounting degree at the equivalent of a community college. She went down to Guangdong province, earned a, um, uh, got a job as an accountant, began to send money back to support that community. Uh, after working as an accountant for a number of years, she went and started her own business. And so many other girls there who otherwise would have been uh, herding goats or working in the rice paddy ended up getting these great jobs and creating this kind of a virtuous cycle in the community. So the upshot is that if you go back to that village, then, you know, make no mistake, I mean, throughout Hubei province, people are far better off than they were. Uh, people are much better educated than they were. But this village is far and away better off. It surpassed all the others because of that one-time bank error. Um, and the, our message is not, in fact, that we want to have more bank errors, um, but that you do begin to see this kind of a virtuous cycle unfold when you invest in girls. And it was these kinds of experiences that led Cheryl and me increasingly to look at these kinds of issues, to look through that prism of gender. And ultimately, that process led us to, uh, to half the sky. There are two basic themes that, uh, two basic arguments we make. The first is that just as the central moral challenge in the 19th century was slavery, and the fundamental moral challenge in the 20th century was totalitarianism, in this century, the paramount moral challenge will be gender inequity around the globe. Normally, we encounter some kind of skeptical glances at that point, but I'm, uh, uh, you guys are all well indoctrinated. Um, I think a lot of people do, though, think that that is meant as hyperbole, um, and it's not. It really is what we believe to be the central moral challenge. And to explain why, let me turn the tables on you and ask you a question. Are there more males or females in the world today? Let's, let's have a little, um, a little poll here. If you think there are uh, more males in the world today, can you raise your hand? And if you think there are more females in the world today, can you raise your hand? I'm afraid this latter group is wrong. First group was right. There are more males in the United States. There are more males in Europe. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, there are more females in the United States, more females in, in Europe. Um, given equal access to food and health care, women live longer. In an equitable world, there would be more women. But this is not an equitable world, and in much of the world, gender discrimination is a matter of life and death, and girls are literally discriminated against to death. Uh, in India, for example, in the first year of life, boys and girls have similar mortality rates because they depend for sustenance on the breast and the breast does not have a strong sun preference. But from age one to age five, girls are 50% more likely to die than boys because they depend upon their parents, including their mothers, who do have a sun preference. The upshot is that worldwide there are between 60 and 110 million 
women who were missing from the planet. Uh, that is why there are more males than females worldwide. And if you think about that number, that means that in the last 50 years, there have been more people discriminated against to death on the basis of their gender than all the people who were killed in all the battlefields of all the wars of the 20th century. In any one decade, more girls are discriminated against to death than all the people who died in all the genocides of the 20th century. The scale is truly astonishing. And that is why we argue that this is the central moral challenge of this century. But there's another theme, and it's a little less grim. And it is that putting aside the moral issues and the terrible things that happen and, and what should be done, just at a purely practical level, if you want to address global poverty, social conflict, so many of the other problems around the world, then the most cost-effective way of doing that is to invest in girls, uh, to focus on women in development, and to see the same kind of a virtuous spiral unfold that happened in Hubei province. Put it another way, women and girls aren't the problem, they're the solution. That's true for um, a few different reasons. One is that one of the central problems in global poverty, as you know, is um, excessive population growth, which causes problems with poverty, with social conflict, this kind of thing. And if you educate a boy, then he will, on average, have somewhat fewer children, but it's a fairly modest effect. If you educate a girl, it's a quite dramatic effect. One of the best ways of bringing about fertility reductions is indeed to educate girls. Another reason to focus on women and girls has to do with what is kind of the dirty little secret of development. And that is that, frankly, a lot of the problems of global poverty are caused not only, a lot of the suffering is caused not only by low incomes, but also by some really bad spending decisions. And those are disproportionately by men. This research is utterly demoralizing to go through if you're a man, I must say. You just want to pull out your checkbook and hand it to your wife, <laughs> which is something wives usually agree with. Um, but it looks as if among uh, the, uh, the families living um, below $2 a person per day, which is one of the standard global metrics of poverty, then these numbers are somewhat fuzzy, but as an order of magnitude, families invest about 2% of their incomes in education. Even though education has a real net positive economic return, it's a great investment. In contrast to that 2%, they invest 20%, or they don't invest, they spend 20% on a combination of alcohol, tobacco, prostitution, um, sugary drinks like soft drinks, and very extravagant festivals. like Aspen. <laughs> Let me just delete that last sentence if I ever want to be invited back. <laughs> um, if you could take four percentage points out of the alcohol, tobacco, prostitution pool and put it in the education pool, you'd have a transformative effect on global poverty. And one way of doing that is to give women more control over the purse strings. That can be educating them so that they have more capacity to generate income. It can be giving them legal title over property, over assets. Um, and it can be other mechanisms in the household that tend to enhance their standing and give them more influence over financial spending. Um, and finally, the most basic reason maybe for focusing on women and girls is just that if you look at poor countries around the world, then the greatest unexploited resource that they have isn't seams of gold or diamond mines. It's the female halves of their population. And if we can help countries figure out how to make better use of that resource, then it's transformative for those countries and for the globe as a whole. Now to talk about what that agenda might mean, let me introduce the better half of our sky, <laughs> Cheryl.
So now I have the depressing part to talk to you about. <laughs> so bear with me. Um, I'll, I will let the sun set naturally. I won't set it early for you. Um, basically, what is the top of the agenda? What is on the top of the agenda? We think that it has to be sex trafficking. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with this issue. It's a really challenging issue. Uh, firstly, because we think that the name sex trafficking doesn't really capture what it is. So let me tell you what happens in general. A 13-year-old girl, a 10-year-old girl gets kidnapped, often you know, taken away from her family. She gets put into a brothel. She's forced to work there uh, without any pay, long hours, and she often isn't even fed properly because they don't want her to get fat. It's really slavery. Uh, it's really um, forced slavery, sex slavery. Uh, we understood this and we came to understand this more uh, when we met someone by the name of Long Pross. Uh, she, just as I had mentioned, just uh, sh again, she was captured when she was 13. She was sent to a brothel. And when she got pregnant twice, had an abortion twice, uh, the brothel owner wanted her to get back to work really quickly. The brothel owner, by the way, was a woman. Uh, she felt terrible. She just really couldn't get back to work, just didn't, beyond the fact that she hated the job. Um, and so when she resisted, the brothel owner gouged out her eye. So it really has some dire consequences in many, many cases. And that phenomenon really shook us up. How do we get first exposed to this phenomenon? We were living in Tokyo. Uh, and covering the region, and we had heard about this sex slavery going on in Cambodia. So Nick made a trip down to Cambodia, and he, um, so he spent some time in an afternoon in the brothel, as a reporter, of course. Uh, <laughs> and he was talking to a 14-year-old and a 15-year-old, and the 15-year-old was explaining that when she was captured, her mother spent months afterwards looking all over the region for her. And just a week before Nick arrived at the brothel, the mother found her daughter. And they had a wonderful reunion, just tearful joy. And so then Nick asked the obvious question, well, then why are you still here? And she explained, well, the brothel owner told my mother that she had paid good money for me. If my mom wanted me back, she would have to pay for me, and she didn't have the money, so she couldn't buy me back. So she left. So Nick felt terrible. He knew that he was going to leave the brothel with a front page story, uh, but that these two girls were probably going to end up staying in the brothel, dying of AIDS. So the next time he went back, he wanted to go back and report on this. He thought he had to do it in a better way. So, uh, he thought of who he could ask. He called up the New York Times lawyer, and he said, Dave, does the New York Times have a policy on buying human beings? <laughs> Dave sort of <laughs> uh, was very, very puzzled and said, no, the New York Times doesn't have a policy on buying human beings yet. Sure enough, Nick went to Cambodia and he bought two human beings, uh, Stray Mom and Stray Net, and some of you may have read his stories about it. Um, there were many ups and downs. He basically uh, bought them, got receipts for them, and uh, he did try to uh, move them from the brothel and then bring them back into normal lives. Uh, it was not easy. It is not easy helping people, as some of you know. Uh, but the upshot is that uh, although there were ups and downs, uh, we were able to help them in the end. And they are doing pretty OK. In fact, one of them do is, is doing very, very well. <laughs> the second item on the agenda is maternal mortality. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, maternal mortality, some of the issues there. Uh, basically, a woman dies every minute and a half or so. Uh, you know, 
somewhere around the world because of um, some uh, childbirth issues or, or problems in labor. Uh, you know, that's almost uh, three or four jet, uh, jets full of women dying every single day. Uh, it's really remarkable how many people are dying. And that's a dramatic improvement over what it was in the previous five years, which used to be a woman dying every minute. So we've made a lot of progress, but it's still a big challenge. Uh, why is it a challenge? It's basically because, you know, women uh, in, the, in much of the developing world have three strikes against them. They are poor, they are rural, and they are female. So that means that where childbirth here in the West is a glorious thing. In Niger, one in seven women can expect to die uh, in childbirth during uh, her lifetime. And so it is a real challenge. And for each woman who does die, there are 20 who survive, but who are injured in, in childbirth or in the process of um, bearing a child. And one of the most devastating injuries is called fistula, obstetric fistula. How many of you heard of that? Oh, good, good. Um, it's, it, you know how pretty devastating uh, an injury it is. Basically, you are incontinent. Um, let me tell you the story uh, of Mahabuba. She, is a, um, she was 13 years old at the time of the story starts in Ethiopia. Uh, she was married against her will. Uh, she was, she got pregnant, and then she ran away to have the baby by, on her own in the bush. Well, you know, she was 13 years old. Uh, her body was very immature. She had obstructed labor, and she ended up with the baby dying and her uh, having a fistula. So that meant that, you know, she basically couldn't control her waists. She was incontinent. She stank. So the villagers had no idea what to do with her. They just didn't know. They thought she was cursed. So they decided to put her in a small hut at the edge of the village. They ripped off the door so that the hyenas would get her at night. And that night, there was a stick in the corner of the hut. She fought off those hyenas all night with that stick. And the next morning, she knew there was a foreign missionary in the nearest village, nearby village. And so if she could get to him, she thought that she could get help. So partly because of the um, obstructed labor, had, it had damaged some of her nerves. She really couldn't walk, so she crawled. And again, to avoid the hyenas at night, the nearest village was 30 miles away. So at night, again, she climbed up the trees to avoid the hyenas. She arrived at the doorstep of this foreign missionary, half dead. He opened the door, took one look, her, look at her, and knew exactly what had happened. He got her to uh, the hospital, the Fishtel Hospital in Addis Ababa, and they stitched her up. It's a you know, $350 operation, a very, very um, cheap operation, very affordable. Uh, and, you know, not only as we know that this girl is a real survivor, survivor, Mahabuba is an amazing survivor, but she was also clever. And uh, so the nurses noticed this, and they decided to give her a few tasks, and pretty soon they gave her more tasks, and now she is a nurse at the hospital, uh, saving thousands of lives other, of other women, really paying back in droves what someone helped her out with just to keep her alive. And she is part of the solution, not the problem. She's an example of that. Her colleague, Mami Chu, same uh, s s type of situation uh, in which she also suffered officially and was brought to the hospital. And it turned out that Mami Chu, uh, who was really good, clever with her, with her, not only with her mind, but also with her, she was very agile with her fingers. And so she started doing surgeries and became the top trainer surgeon for uh, doctors, new doctors who came into the hospital and had to learn how to do fistulas, uh, fistula repairs. And mommy too was unusual in that she was totally illiterate. So here was an illiterate uh, trainer uh, doctor, trainer surgeon, 
um, after a few years of being totally embarrassed that she couldn't read or write, she enrolled herself in school, and last we heard she was in the third grade reading level. Again, she is part of the solution, not the problem. So, you know, these are examples of uh, real challenges that uh, the developing world faces, and, uh, you know, they've been a little bit depressing, but uh, there are solutions, and we heard a few of the solutions that we also face in this country, um, education and economic opportunity. That's what it is. It's basically jobs and education. Uh, that's what they need abroad as well. Uh, in basically in giving a woman economic opportunity, you give her the chance to have a livelihood, uh, to stand on her own two feet, to pl have a role in society, uh, and to contribute to the household economics, uh, to the county, uh, as you saw with the, in the case of Daimanju, and ultimately to the national uh, gross, gross national product, which is just so key for women in this part of the world. Um, let me tell you the story of Saima. Saima uh, is an example of someone who really was able to transform her family uh, through economic opportunity. She uh, is a woman who lives in a small village outside Lahore in Pakistan. Uh, she basically was miserable. Uh, her life was miserable because she was beaten every single day by her husband, who was not employed. He was kind of a gambler type, so that he was not very employable. And he would take his frustrations out on Saima by beating her up. When Saima had her second daughter, again, they favor sons, uh, her mother-in-law turned to her son and said, you know, you better get a second wife because I don't think Saima is going to bear you a son. She was devastated. Just so happens at that time, there was a micro lending group in, in, in the village. They gave Saima a $65 loan. And so Saima had to think, what am I going to do with this? Well, uh, she could do embroidery. So she thought she would start a, a small embroidery business. And it turns out that she was really good at embroidery. And so she started embroidering. And the merchants kept asking for more. And pretty soon they were asking for more than she could produce. She started hiring other women in, in the village. Pretty soon she had 30 women in the village working for her. And she had so much product that had to be transported from the village to the marketplace, she needed someone to help her transport that, those goods. So she hired her husband. So now they're in business together. He does the marketing and transportation distribution. She does the production and sourcing, and they have transformed the village. The village now is really an embroidery village. They, uh, everybody's standard of living has risen. Uh, Saima's, um, now she has a third daughter, but all her girls are doing very well in school. They've got special tutors. Her oldest daughter is the top of her class because she knows how important education is as well as economic opportunity. So that brings me to education. You all know how important education is. It's not only important here, it's important around the world. It's important in the tiny little village you've never even heard of, uh, that in, where people make under $2 a day. It's important there, too. Um, Larry Summers, when he was chief economist of the World Bank, uh, said that it may well be that the highest return on your investment in the developing world is in girls' education. And you know we can see how transformative education is, not only with Diamond Jew, but um, in Africa as well, uh, Beatrice uh, Bira is one example of how education transformed her and her family. Beatrice, like Diamond Jew, um, well, actually, she was even worse off because at nine years old, Beatrice had never been to a single day of school. Her parents, again, said, why should we spend any money uh, on school fees for Beatrice because she's going to be spending her days lugging water, uh, you know, and, and working in the fields. A waste of money. Um, well, Beatrice was really heartbroken. She really wanted to go to school. Well, just so happens at that time, there was a um, Neantic Community ch uh, Church group in Connecticut that made a donation to a organization based in Arkansas called Heifer International. I know you guys have heard of Heifer. Well, uh, Heifer uh, took that donation and sent two goats to Africa. 
One of those goats ended up with Beatrice's parents. That goat had twins, and the twins started producing milk, and the parents started selling the milk, turning it into cash. The cash started accumulating, and finally they said, hmm, we have enough money, we can actually start to send Beatrice to school. So at nine years old, Beatrice was delighted. She had to start you know, in first grade with the six-year-olds, but that didn't matter. She was just delighted to be there. She rocketed to the top of her class. She stayed at the top of her class in elementary school, in middle school, and then in high school. She scored brilliantly on the national examinations. She became the first person in her village to get a scholarship to come to the United States. And so two years ago, uh, she graduated from Connecticut College. You know, and that goat, <laughs> on, her, on her day of graduation at the party, she said, you know, I am the luckiest girl alive because of a goat. And that goat was $120. So it doesn't take that much. Um, and it was transformative. And you know something? Uh, she then got an internship uh, during one summer with the Millennium Project and Jeffrey Sachs. She is doing a graduate work in development because she wants to go back to her, her, her country and try and work on development. So again, she is part of the solution, not a problem. So women can really be uh, the solution. And you know, it takes a village to really uh, turn them into the solution. I mean, it, it, this is a social uh, problem that, that requires social change by both men and women working together. Uh, it's not just something that uh, can be brought, change can't be brought about just by women. So, I mean, we really do think um, uh, that individuals can make a difference here, but we also want to give you a reality check. You know, helping people is hard. And I'm sure a number of you have read a lot of the criticism of US aid projects, foreign aid projects, uh, you know, the book called Dead Aid. Um, Bill Easterly has written a book on, on criticizing foreign aid. It's true. Uh, people cite the fact that a year later, um, water projects, water wells, half of them have failed. When we were in Zimbabwe in March, uh, we were touring a village, and sure enough, as the village chief was you know, trying to sing the praises of the village because he wanted to raise money for a secondary school, uh, you know, I noticed there was some construction in one part of the village, and I asked him what that was. He kind of mumbled and walked away, and then he said, it turns out that it was a failed irrigation project. And just a few yards away was a failed chicken coop project. All the chickens died one year, so no one wants to put their chickens in that project anymore. So it is true that it is not easy. But we actually look at this and say, well, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's actually uh, you know, applaud the fact that 50% of projects actually survive in these kind of conditions, and you learn from your mistakes. Just what you do in the business world, you, it's continuous improvement, you learn from your mistakes. And so we really think that um, not only does it take foreign aid projects, but it also takes people, individuals helping individuals. In the same way that Beatrice was helped by $120, you know, individuals uh, can, can help and make a, a great big difference. I think of the parable that maybe some of you know. It's a Hawaiian parable. Well, bear with me. It's, um, this take, it's a story of a boy who's walking on a beach. Uh, of course, this is Hawaii. Uh, and the beach is just covered with starfish. He picks up a starfish, throws one back into the ocean, picks up another starfish, throws it back into the water. And along comes a man who looks at the boy and says, boy, you're crazy. There are thousands of starfish on this beach. You can't possibly make a difference. The boy looks at him, picks up a starfish, throws it back into the water, and says, it made a big difference to that one. <laughs> so you see, it made a big difference to that one, exactly. Um, but then the question is, you know, um, why should you care? What's in it for you? And I have two things to say to that. There are very few things in life, uh, research shows, there are very few things in life, once you have um, all your material needs satisfied, which all of us here in this room do, in this tent do, um, 
There are very few things in life that actually can elevate your level of happiness. Uh, it's very hard to change your set point for happiness, research shows. One of those things is contributing to a cause larger than yourself. So then the question uh, is, and I'll leave you with this, this anecdote, is, is really why. Um, why you should care. Um, and the story is of a aid worker in Darfur. Uh, she, you know, was very strong in, in, in working, uh, you know, helping the Darfuris there with their, their plight. Uh, she saw things that no human being should see. And yet, the entire time, she was strong she was steadfast. She never broke down. And then she was back home uh, on vacation over Christmas in her grandmother's backyard. And she saw something that made her break down in tears. What was that? It was a bird feeder. And she realized that she had the great fortune of being born in a land where we take security for granted, where we not only feed, can feed, can house, can clothe ourselves, but also provide for wild birds so that they don't go hungry in the winter. And she realized that with this great fortune comes great responsibility. So like her, you, me, we all have won the lottery of life. The question is, how do we discharge that responsibility? And so, here's the cause. Join the movement, feel happier, and help save the world. Thank you very much.